And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, the United States, Britain and Canada plan to announce a coordinated set of sanctions against Iran. ABC News and The Wall Street Journal report the sanctions will target Iran's oil and petrochemical industry. Last weekend, President Obama warned no options were being taken off the table. The sanctions have enormous bite and enormous scope, and we're building off the platform uh, that uh, has already been established. Uh, the question is, are there additional uh, measures that we can take? And we're going to explore every avenue to see if we can solve this issue diplomatically. Uh, I have said repeatedly, and I will re uh, say today, uh, we are not taking any options off the table. International pressure has been mounting on Iran since the U.N. International Atomic Energy Agency revealed in a report the, quote, possible military dimensions to its nuclear activities. The IAEA said credible evidence, quote, indicates Iran has carried out activities relevant to the development of a nuclear explosive device. The IAEA passed a resolution Friday expressing, quote, increasing concern about Iran's nuclear program following the report's findings. The Speaker of Iran's parliament said yesterday Yesterday, Iran would review its relations with the IAEA following the report. Ali Larjani indicated it may be difficult for Iran to continue to cooperate with a nuclear watchdog. If the agency acts within the framework of the charter, we accept that we are a member of it and will carry out our responsibilities. But if the agency wants to deviate from its responsibilities, then it should not expect the others' cooperation. Iranian parliamentary speaker. Meanwhile, some Iranians have expressed the desire for increased cooperation with the IAEA. Considering the fact that the government has made plenty of clarifications, it would be better for it to expand its cooperation with the IAEA and let them see for themselves, close up, so there would be no pretext for the superpowers. Last week, the Pentagon confirmed it has received massive new bunker-busting bombs capable of destroying underground sites, including Iran's nuclear facilities. The 30,000-pound bombs are six times the size of the Air Force's current arsenal of bunker busters. The new sanctions against Iran also follow last month's allegations by the United States that Iranian officials were involved in a thwarted plot to kill the Saudi ambassador to Washington. The U.S. is expected to announce today that Iran's financial sector is of primary money laundering concern. This phrase activates a section of the USA Patriot Act that warns European, Asian and Latin American companies they could be prevented from doing business with the United States if they continue to work with Iran. Well, to talk more about the sanctions and the implications of the IAEA report, we go to Washington, D.C., to speak with Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch. He's been reporting on Iran and the bomb for the past decade. His latest piece is titled Iran and the IAEA. It's in The New Yorker. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Sai. Uh, talk about what you feel um, uh, should be understood about what's happening in Iran right now in regards to its nuclear power um, sector. Well, you, you mentioned going in. By the way, the piece was in the blog. It wasn't in the magazine. It was on the web page. But um, you mentioned Iraq. It's This is almost the same sort of I don't know if you want to call it a psychosis, but it's some sort of a, a, a fantasy land being built up here, uh, as it was with Iraq. The same sort of I, no lessons, no lessons learned. Obviously, look, uh, I have been reporting uh, about Iran, and I can tell you that since '04, uh, under uh, George Bush and particularly uh, the Vice President Mr. Cheney, uh, we were uh, Cheney was particularly concerned there were secret facilities for building a weapon, which are much different than the enrichment. We have enrichment in Iran; they've acknowledged it. They have inspectors there. There are cameras there, et cetera. This is all. Iran's a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Nobody's accusing them of any cheating. In fact, the latest report that everybody's so um, uh, agog about uh, also says that, once again, we find no evidence that Iran, uh, Iran has diver diverted any uranium that it's enriching. And it's also enriching, enriching essentially, to very low levels for peaceful purposes, so they say, 3.8 percent. Um, and so. There is a small percentage being enriched to 20 percent for medical uh, uh, use, but that's quite small, also under cameras, under inspection. Uh, what you have is, um, uh, in those days, in 04, 05, 06, or 07, even until the end of their, uh, their term in office, Cheney ke uh, kept on having the Joint Special Operations Force uh, Command, JSOC. Uh, they would send teams inside uh, Iran. 
they would work with various dissident groups, the Azeris, the Kurds, even Jandela, which is a very fanatic Sunni uh, opposition group. Um, and they would uh, do everything they could to try and find evidence of an undeclared underground facility. Uh, we monitored everything. We have incredible surveillance. In those days, uh, what we did then, we can even do better now. And some of the stuff is very technical, very classified, but I can tell you there's not much you can do in Iran right now with us without us finding out something about it. They found nothing, nothing, no evidence of any weaponization. In other words, no evidence of a, of a facility to build the bomb. They have facilities to enrich, but not separate facilities for building a bomb. This is simply a fact. We haven't found it if it does exist. It's still a fantasy. We still want to think, many people do think it does. The big change was in the, uh, in the last few weeks, the IAEA came out with a new report. Um, and um, it's not a, a scientific report, it's, it's a political document. It takes a lot of the old allegations that have been made over the years that were looked at by the IAEA under the regime or the directorship of Mohammed el Barati, who ran uh, the IAEA for 12 years, the Egyptian. He won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work somebody who was very skeptical of, uh, of Iran in the beginning and became less so as Iran went, went, was more and more open. But the new director of the IAEA, a Japanese official named Amano, um, uh, an old um, sort of from the center-right party in Japan, I'm sure he's an honorable guy, he believes what he believes, but we happen to have a series of WikiLeaks documents uh, from the American embassy uh, in uh, Vienna, one of the embassies in Vienna, reporting on how great it was to get a mono there. This is uh, last year. These documents were released by the Julian Assange's group um, and are quite important because what the documents say is that Amano has pledged his fail fealty to America. I understand that, uh, he was elected as a, he's a marginal candidate. We supported him very much. Six ballots. He was considered weak by everybody, but we pushed to get him in. We did get him in. He, he responded by thanking us and saying he shares our views. He shares our views of, on Iran. He's going to be do. He's basically, it was just an expression of love. He's going to do what we wanted. This new report has nothing new in it. This isn't me talking. This is, uh, I, in, in the piece I did for the New Yorker blog, um, it's different for the blog because it has more reporting in it. I talked to former inspectors. There are different voices than you read in the New York Times and the Washington Post. There are other people that don't get reported, who are much more skeptical of this report. And you just don't see it in the, in the coverage. So what we're getting is a very small slice in the newspaper, mainstream press here, of, um, of, of analysis of this report. There's a completely different analysis, which is very little new. And the way it works, Amy, is over the years, a, um, a, a report will show up in a London newspaper that will turn out to be spurious, will turn out to be propaganda, whether started by us or a European intelligence agency. It's not clear. This all happened, if you remember, the Ahmed Shalabi stuff um, during the buildup to the war in Iran, <clears throat> all about, um, uh, you know, the, um, the, the great arsenals that existed inside Iran. Uh, the same sort of propaganda is being used now, <clears throat> pardon me, I have a slight cold, um, that uh, shows up. Over the years, over the last decade, in various newspapers, the IAEA would look at it, rule it not to be, be a fabrication or certainly not to be supportable by anything they know. All of these old reports, with the exception of, I think, in the new study that was put out by the IAEA, there were maybe 30 or 40 old items with only three things past 2008, all of which are, they, uh, many people on the, in, inside the IAEA believe to be spurious, not very reliable fabrications. So there you are. So, Cy Hirsch, you're saying um, that it's not new information, it's a new head of the IAEA that's making the difference here. Can you talk more about U.S. infiltration of Iran, JSOC and Iran surveillance um, as well in Iran? Sure. I mean, the kind of stuff they did. I could tell you stuff that um, um, that was secret uh, eight, nine years ago. We would, for example, we developed—if there was an underground facility we thought was where we saw some digging, 
let's say, in a mountain area, we would line the road when there were trucks going up and down the road. We would lie, line the road with what seemed to be pebbles. In fact, they were sensors that could measure the weight of trucks going in and out. If a truck would go in light and come out with heavy, we could assume it was coming out with dirt. They were doing digging. We did that kind of monitoring. We also put all sorts of passive uh, 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 counters, measures of radioacti radioactivity, uranium, even plutonium. Most of the stuff that's being done there is enriched uranium. They're not making plutonium. Him. But um, uh, you can track it. At a certain point, you have to move it. Once you take it out and start moving it around, you can track it. You can find the Geiger counters, if you will, to use that old-fashioned term. You can measure radioactivity and see increases. We would go into a building. <coughs> our troops, are, are, uh, sometimes even with Americans, go into a building in Tehran where we thought there was something uh, fishy going on, start a disturbance down the street, take out a few bricks, slam in another section of brick with a, with a, a Geiger counter, if you will, or a measuring device to see if in that building they were doing some enrichment we didn't know about. And we also have incredible com competence at looking for air holes uh, from the air, from satellites. If you're building an underground facility, you have to vent it. You have to get air into it. You have to find a way to remove bad air and put in fresh air. And so we have guys that are experts, uh, tremendous people in the community. Some of them retired and set up a private company to do this. They would w monitor all of the aerial surveillance to look for air holes so we could find a pattern, try to find a pattern of an underground, underground facility. Nada. We came up with nothing. And the most important thing is we also, and the IA, even this new report also says, let me emphasize this. If you're not diverting um, uh, uranium, if you're not taking uranium out of the count and smuggling it someplace so that you can build a bomb, and that the IAEA is, is absolutely categorical on everything that they are enriching, whatever percentage they enrich to is under camera inspection and under inspection of inspections. It's all open under the treaty, uh, the Safeguard Treaty. Uh, um, uh, nobody's accusing Iran of violating the, the treaty. They're just accusing them of cheating on the side or some evidence they are. And there's been no evidence of a diversion. So if you're going to make a bomb, you're going to have to bring it in from someplace else. And given the kind of surveillance we have, that's going to be hard to do, to import it from a third country, bring in uranium and enrich it, or enrich uranium. It's just a long shot. And what you have is, as I said, it's, it's some sort of a hysteria that we had over Iraq that's coming up again in Iran. And this isn't a plea for Iran. There's a lot of things that the Iranians do that are, is objectionable, the way they treat dissent, et cetera, et cetera. So this, I'm just speaking within the context of the hull and blue that's up now. And as far as sanctions are concerned, you know, excuse me, we've been sanctioning uh, Cuba for 60 years, and Castro is, is you know, is, he may be ill, but he's still there. Sanctions are not going to work. This is a country that produces oil and gas. Uh, less and less, but still plenty of it. And they have customers uh, the, in the Far East, uh, the Iranians, um, um, they have customers for their, for their energy. We're the losers in this. How would you compare the Obama administration to the Bush administration when it comes to Iran? Um, uh, I can't find a comparison. Same, a little less bellicose, but the same thing. Um, I do think, uh, I have every reason to believe that, um, uh, unlike Mr. Bush, uh, President Obama really is worried about an attack. He doesn't want to see the Israelis bomb uh, Iran. That's the kind of talk we've been getting in the press lately. And there's new, as you mentioned, the 30,000-pound bombs built by Boeing, I think. Um, the problem is that most of Iran's facilities, the ones that we know about, the declared facilities under camera inspection, a place called the Tans, is about 80, 75 to 80 feet underground. And you'd have to do a hell of a lot of bombing. Uh, to do much damage to it. You could certainly do damage to it, but the cost internationally would be stupendous. I, there's, the argument for going and bombing is so vague and so nil. There's been studies done showing uh, technical studies, MIT and other places, and the Israeli government also has had its scientists participate in these studies, showing it would be really hard uh, to do a significant amount of damage, uh, given how deep the underground facilities are. Uh, but you hear this talk about it, it's, it's, and there's you know, uh, look, this is this president has said nothing about what's going on in Tahir Square again. Uh, we're mute. Uh, he's been uh, mute on this kind of uh, uh, the bellicosity. But I, my understanding is that um, uh, purely from um, uh, inside information is that uh, he does understand uh, the issues more. I think it's right now a political game being played by him um, to look tough. You know, everybody's cool. chasing, you know, the independent vote. I don't know why what's so important to 
to go after people. I can't decide whether they're Democrats or Republicans, but that seems to be the name of the game. Well, let's turn to the response in Israel to the IAEA report. Yesterday, Israeli Defense Minister Hud Barak said in an interview with CNN, the time has come to deal with Iran. When asked specifically whether Israel would attack Iran, this is how he responded. I don't think that that's a subject for, for public uh, discussion. Uh, but I can tell you that, uh, that the IAEA report is, uh, has a sobering impact on many in the world, leaders as well as the publics. And people understand that the time had come. Amano told straightly what he found, unlike Baradei. And uh, it, it became a major issue that I think duly so. Uh, becomes a major uh, issue for sanctions, for intensive diplomacy, with urgency. People understand now that Iran is determined to reach nuclear weapons. No other possible or conceivable explanation for what they had been actually doing, and that should be stopped. That was the Israeli Defense Minister, Hud Barak. Asai, your response? Well, I uh, what makes me nervous is uh, Barack and uh, Bibi, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, are, are together on this. They, they're not always together on many things. They both agree. Um, and that's worrisome because, uh, again, it's a political issue there. Everybody, the country is moving quickly to the right, Israel is, obviously. And um, I, I can just tell you that I've also talked. Um, un unfortunately, the ground rules are so lousy in Israel, I can't. We, I can't. We, I can't write it. But I've talked to very senior intelligence people in Iran, in Israel rather. If you notice, it, you, you don't hear that much about it. But the former head of Mossad, Meir Dagan, who uh, left, uh, who was the guy that orchestrated the attempted assassinations in Dubai, et cetera, no dove, has been vehement about the uh, the foolishness of attempting to go after Iran on the grounds that it's not clear what they have. They're certainly far away from a bomb. Israel's been saying for 20 years they're you know six months away from making a bomb. But I can tell you that. I've talked to senior Israeli officers in Israel who have told me, A, uh, they know that Iran, as the, um, uh, as the American intelligence community reported, um, uh, I think it was in 07, uh, the, there was a national intelligence estimate that became public that said, essentially, Iran did look at the bomb. They had an eight-year war with Iraq. A terrible war, 1980 to 1988. And we, by the way, the United States sided with Iraq, Saddam Hussein at that time. Iran then, in the years after that, they began to worry about Iraq's talk about building a nuclear weapon. So they did look in that period, let's say 87 to 97 to 2003, no question, the American NIE said in 07, it was um, augmented in 2011. I wrote about it a year ago in The New Yorker. It said, yes, they did look at a bomb. Um, but um, not to, they knew that they couldn't. There's no way they could make a bomb to deter America or Israel. They're they're not fools. This Persian society's been around for a couple thousand years. They can't deter us. We have too many bombs. They thought maybe they could deter Iraq. After we went in and took down Iraq uh, in '03, they stopped. So they had done some studies. We're talking about computer modeling, et cetera, no building. They no question they looked at the idea of getting a bomb or getting to the point where maybe they could make one. Um, they did do that, but they stopped in 03. That's still the American consensus. Uh, the Israelis will tell you privately, yes, we agree. They stopped most of their planning, even their studies, in 03. The Israeli position is they stopped not because they saw what we did to Iraq, but they thought that we could we destroyed Iraq. I had a general tell me this. We destroyed Iraq in um, it took them uh, we did in three weeks what they could do in eight years. They thought they would be next. But the consensus was, yes, they stopped. And also, if you ask serious, smart, wise Israelis in the intelligence business, and there are many, do you really think if they got a bomb and they don't have one now, they would hit Tel Aviv? And the answer was, you think they're crazy? We would incinerate them. Of course not. They've been around 2,000 years. That's not going to happen. Their fear was they would give a bomb to somebody else, et cetera. But there's an ra element of ra rationality in the Israeli intelligence community that's not being expressed by the political leadership. It's the same madness we have here. Uh, there's an element of rationality in our intelligence community which says, in 07, and it is said, it is said and again last year, they don't have the bomb. They're not making it. It's an NIE. Sixteen agencies agreed, 16 to nothing, in an internal vote before that. Uh, they did an update in 2011 on the 07 study and came to the same place. 
It's just not there. That doesn't mean they don't have dreams. It doesn't mean scientists don't do computer studies. It doesn't mean that uh, physicists at the University of uh, Tehran don't do what physicists like to do, write papers and do studies. But there's just no evidence of any systematic effort to go from enriching uranium to making a bomb. It's a huge, difficult process. You have to take a very hot gas and convert it into a metal and then convert it into a core. And you have to do that by remote control because you can't get near that stuff. It'll kill you. So radioactive. I mean, so, uh, look, <laughs> I'm a lone voice. And you know how careful The New Yorker is, even in a blog item. This piece was checked and rechecked. And I quote people, uh, Joe Cirincioni, an American who's been involved in this army many years. These are different voices than you're seeing in the, in the papers. I, I sometimes get offended by the same voices we see in The New York Times and Washington Post. We don't see people with different points of view. There are inside the, uh, not only the American intelligence community, but also inside the uh, IAEA in Vienna. There are many people who cannot stand what Amano's doing, and many people who basically, um, I, I get emails, and this piece came out, uh, was put up, uh, I think, over the weekend, and um, I get emails like, like crazy uh, from people on the inside saying, way to go. Uh, I'm talking about inside the IAEA. It's, it's an organization that doesn't deal with the press, but internally, they're very bothered by the direction Amano is taking them. It's not a scientific study, Amy. It's a political document, and it's a political document in which he's playing our game. And it's the same game the Israelis are picking up on and those who don't like Iran. And I, I wish we could separate our feelings about Iran and the mullahs and what happened with the, with the students from 1979 into the reality, which is that I think there's a very serious chance the Iranians would certainly give us the kind of inspections we want uh, in return uh, for a little love, an end to sanctions and a respect that they insist that they want to get from us. And it's not happening from this administration. Seymour Hersh, I want to thank you very much for being with us. His latest piece is on the blog at The New Yorker. It's called Iran and the IAEA. Seymour Hersh won the Pulitzer Prize. His uh, piece you can see at uh, The New Yorker's website. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we are going to talk about Egypt and the scores of people who've been killed there just over the last few few days as people protest in the lead-up to the parliamentary elections, calling for the end of military rule in Egypt. Stay with us. Saz Vavaz here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Mass protests in Egypt have entered a third day in cities across the country, calling for the country's military rulers to quickly transfer power to a civilian government. The fiercest clash is taking place in Cairo's Tahrir Square, where thousands of protesters have been battling with security forces continuously since Saturday morning. Democracy Now! correspondent Truth Abdokadus is on the ground in Cairo. He's been covering the protests since they began. He files this report. Ten months after the Egyptian revolution began, Tahrir Square is once again the epicenter of a new uprising in Egypt. Thousands of people have taken to the streets to protest the Supreme Council of Armed Forces that came to power after the fall of Hosni Mubarak. For close to 40 straight hours, protesters clashed with security forces in downtown Cairo in some of the fiercest street battles since the revolution began. Protests have spread to Alexandria, Suez, and several other big cities. At least 12 people have been killed, according to the Ministry of Health, and more than 1,400 injured, 
in what has become a mass stand against military rule. The new uprising began in the wake of a massive protest on November 18th, originally called for by Islamist groups, but attended by tens of thousands of men, women and children from across the political spectrum. The protest was staged 10 days before parliamentary elections are scheduled to take place. Thousands gathered in Tahrir on Friday to demonstrate against the Military Council's rule and its recent moves to control the writing of the Constitution and entrench its grip on power. While most left the square by nightfall, a few hundred stayed the night for an open-ended sit-in. But early the next morning, Central Security Forces stormed Tahrir and violently dispersed those who had set up camp. It wasn't long before hundreds of protesters descended on Tahrir in solidarity. Clashes with police quickly escalated. Protesters threw rocks while security forces used rubber bullets and a seemingly endless supply of tear gas on the crowds. This is Shadi Muhammad, a high school teacher. <laughs> This gas burns the face. It feels like there is poison in your mouth and it affects your nervous system. They have been firing it since 2 p.m. until now, about 24 hours non-stop. We go forward, then retreat. We don't know what they want. I was standing in the middle of the clashes. I got hit in the head with a rock and took three stitches. I'm still here and I will stay here until we reach some kind of solution. The street clashes continued unabated through Saturday night and into the next day. Many hundreds were wounded. Many were overcome by tear gas and collapsed. Many were hit directly in the face with rubber bullets. Malik Mustafa, a well-known activist, was blinded in his right eye, as were numerous others. Protesters set up field hospitals in and around the square. Mohammed Abdullah is a volunteer physician. Listen, the police here is so stupid. They have no sense. They're killing people. This, this shoot gun, they, they was targeting on me. Not uh, random shotgun. Okay, they're targeting people. They targeting the bomb, the gas bombs. So don't uh, throw it randomly. Okay, they throw on the mosque. They throw on the hospital. Will, will, when they get into the square, they throw on us. They have no mind. Okay, that's all. Okay. I was uh, there in, right, in front of the uh, police. Okay, bringing some patients to the clinic. They shot. Uh, gas bombs and then I was like uh, no barrier uh, uh, between us okay they shot me in shotgun I got uh, six uh, six balls six balls in my head and two balls here and four balls here okay these were uh, pallets balls small balls okay They're this is forbidden this is forbidden Okay, yes. And gases, and they use uh, stones and uh, a shotgun and uh, gas. Okay. And, uh, and can you describe the effect of the gas on people? The gas uh, make people uh, dozy and uh, can't uh, take his breath and uh, like uh, vomiting. Okay, can't uh, open his eyes, tears and uh, saliva. They like destroy the people like five minutes. They can't. They have no control. Okay, they can't run. They can't move. Some people uh, get into coma. Chants against the Supreme Council of Armed Forces and Field Marshal Hussein Tantawi, the de facto ruler of the country, filled the square. Protesters said they would not leave until they saw change. My name is Nasser Abdel Hadi. I am here because we don't feel like we had a revolution at all. Our demands at the beginning of the revolution were freedom, dignity and social justice. We have not seen social justice. We had a regime that looked like this building here. The building is 10 stories. We got rid of two stories. But there are eight stories to go that we can't get rid of. They're built in tight. They're the ones ruining the country left and right.
Mustafa Sade is a 17-year-old protester who took part in the revolution on January 25th and was one of the thousands of young men who had flooded Tahrir once again. I came here yesterday uh, at night because uh, I, I was going, I was at TEDx Youth uh, Cairo and then I, I heard about what's happening so I, I came directly, I went home, then I waited for my parents so they can come and they approved and they came with me and uh, the three of us went, uh, came here. We met lots of people who were very injured, our friends, our families who were injured and I went to the front lines, I, I checked what's happening, people, it was awful, the CS gas is, is horrible, it's, it's uglier than ever, it's, it's the worst, yeah. <laughs> Weapons are they using? Uh, they're using the rubber bullets and uh, the other kind of bullets that like, uh, like flour flourishes in the air and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it hurts lots of people. Yeah, like, uh, you know, Malik Mustafa, the activist, he, ha he lost his eye. Uh, lots, several other people lost their eyes. Uh, and, and actually, the, the revolutionary people who were injured in Jan 25, they also got. Uh, got injured like the, there was one guy who, who had lost his eye and he lost his, his other eye yesterday so he had, he had both his eyes lost it's important for anyone to be here because it's not a matter of uh, yay we're fighting the cops and stuff it's a matter of rebuilding the country from from point zero to, to start clean and you, you have you have the, the, this this grain of, uh, of blackness of of uh, evil is still here so we have to eliminate so everyone should be here. By Sunday afternoon, the clashes showed no signs of abating. At around 5.30 p.m., the police and the army launched a coordinated and brutal attack to take back the square. They stormed forward with police vehicles and large volleys of tear gas. The sound of gunfire filled the air. The protesters were forced back into side streets. Bodies were left lying on the ground. In disturbing footage, a motionless body was dragged by security forces a few yards to the side of the street and left amongst a pile of garbage. Other bodies lay motionless on the nearby sidewalk. After the police and army inexplicably retreated, protesters defiantly moved back into the square. Their tents had been set on fire. At the field hospital, a chaotic scene unfolded, with the dead and wounded being carried in in droves many of them young boys. By nightfall, thousands had filled the square again with loud chants against the military council. Ambulances waded through the crowd ferrying the wounded to nearby hospitals. The outcome of the clashes remains unclear, but Egypt is witnessing what appears to be a renewed uprising. For Democracy Now!, I'm Sharif Abdul Kudus with Jackie Suen in Cairo, Egypt. Special thanks to Cressida True and Pierre Sufi. This update century report came in. The AP reports the Ministry of Health in Egypt has raised its casualty figures to at least 35 dead and more than 1,750 wounded. Sharif's reporting from Egypt is made possible in part by the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. When we come back, we go to the University of California, Davis, where police pepper sprayed at point-blank range students. Stay with us.
Hamza al -Din here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Uh, shout out to today's visiting class at Democracy Now!, the graduate students from St. John's University Communications and Media Studies Department. We turn now to the Occupy movements and the increasingly brutal police response around the country at the University of California Davis campus on Friday. Campus police officers use pepper spray against student protesters. Videos of the incident have spread rapidly on the internet. The footage shows two police officers firing pepper spray at point-blank range on a group of students sitting together in the quad to protest the dismantling of the Occupy UC Davis encampment. The students were peacefully sitting down cross-legged with their arms locked when the officers began pepper spraying them at close range as people around them shout, don't shoot students. The University of California, Davis, has announced it's placed two police officers on administrative paid leave after pepper spraying the group of student protesters. The incident has sparked calls for the resignation of UC Davis Chancellor Linda Katehi, who initially defended the actions of campus police. Katehi has since said she wants an outside independent panel to review what happened. In a written statement Saturday, she said, quote, the use of pepper spray, as shown on the video, is chilling to us all and raises many questions about how best to handle situations like this. To this effect, I am forming a task force made of faculty, students and staff to review the events and provide to me a thorough report within 90 days, she wrote. On Saturday, following Katehi's brief press conference, students began to surround the building in protest. When Katehi eventually emerged to leave, she walked past a group of students nearly three blocks long who, in a coordinated effort, remained completely silent. And for our radio listeners, you can go to our website to see the silent walk of the chancellor. To talk more about what happened at UC Davis, we go to Sacramento, California, to talk to Ellie Pearson, one of the students pepper sprayed Friday. She's a sophomore at UC Davis studying sustainable agriculture and food systems. We're also joined from Berkeley by Nathan Brown, assistant professor of English at UC Davis. He wrote an open letter calling for the resignation of UC Davis Chancellor Linda Katehi following the pepper spraying incident Friday. Before we turn to our guests, let me just play a short clip, which shows Ellie Pearson being pepper sprayed. I want to turn to Ellie Pearson. Uh, Ellie, describe exactly what happened on Friday. Well, we were protesting together, and the riot cops came at us, and we linked arms and sat down peacefully to protest their presence on our campus. Um, and at one point, they were, we had encircled them, and they were trying to leave, and they were trying to clear a path. And so we sat down, linked arms, and said that if they wanted to clear the path, they would have to go through us. Um, but we were on the ground, you know, heads down, and all I could see was people telling me to cover my head, protect myself, and put my head down. And then next thing I know, I was pepper sprayed. You were in the white jacket? Yes, I was. And what did the pepper spraying feel like? Um, well, I couldn't see anything, and so if I, you know, I felt like pepper spray go over my body, and then I started choking on the fumes. Um, and I lifted my head at one point, and one of the protesters had come to kind of protect our huddle of people, and he just told me to keep my head down. Um, and then from that point on, all I could hear was screaming around me and people being jostled. Two people, two of the students were taken to the hospital? Um, yes, yeah, so it was actually three students. Why were you there? Why were you protesting? 
Um, well, I mean, one, I was standing in solidarity with students at UC, da or at UC Berkeley who were beaten by police. Um, two, I'm protesting the tuition hikes that are happening on campuses, uh, public universities really all over the nation. And three, I was standing in solidarity with the Occupy Wall Street movement. Did the police say we're about to pepper spray you? Um, they, I believe they told maybe one student or like had some dialogue, but certainly not everyone could hear. It wasn't like an announcement that was made. And we weren't aware that we were going to be, I wasn't aware I was going to be pepper sprayed until people told me to protect myself. I and mean, then I have friends who were pepper sprayed who said they did not know that that was happening and that that was coming. Um, and they, we were actually expected, we were expecting to be shot in the back with something because they were behind us. Um, and we, we really had no idea what was going to happen. Nathan Brown, you're an assistant professor of English at UC Davis. You're not tenured, um, so your job is certainly vulnerable. Yet you wrote an open letter calling for the resignation of UC Davis Chancellor Linda Katehi following the pepper spraying of Ellie and the other students. Um, what are you calling for? What is this open letter? Uh, the open letter calls directly uh, for the immediate resignation of the chancellor. Um, there are also now efforts on the Davis campus uh, spearheaded by the board of the UC Davis Faculty Association, uh, as well as others, um, to institute policies which will prevent the forcible removal of student protesters from the campus by police. Why are you calling for Katahi, the UC Davis chancellor's resignation? Um, because what we've been seeing for two years on various UC campuses is that senior UC administrators basically use police brutality as a systematic tool to terrorize student and faculty protesters, to suppress dissent, uh, to suppress free speech, and to intimidate students um, into not protesting, uh, which, of course, uh, has not worked. Students continue to protest. But it's this systematic use of police brutality, basically, to enforce tuition increases. Explain uh, what the tuition to hold... issue is. Well, in, in 2005, uh, tuition at UC campuses was around $6,000. It's currently around $13,000. Uh, and there's currently a plan proposed by UC President Mark Udoff to increase tuition by 81 percent over the next four years. So that would raise tuition to around $23,000. So what we're looking at is within 10 years, a tuition increase of around $6,000 to $23,000. And that's what students are protesting. Are you concerned about your own job? You're not tenured. Um, of course, it's always possible that there could be some sort of retribution from the administration. At the same time, uh, I feel like I have a tremendous amount of support from my department, a tremendous amount of support from the Faculty Association, uh, from my colleagues throughout UC Davis and throughout the UC system. And indeed, I've been receiving thousands and thousands of letters of support from around the world over the past three days. Um, so in my opinion, the best way to go about these things as a junior faculty member is to speak up openly. Um, and in that way, you draw a lot of support, and that I think will be very helpful. Um, in protecting me and protecting other people who speak out uh, if there's any effort at retribution by the administration. Calls are being uh, coming in for uh, a banning of police on campus. Who are the security on campus? And Ellie Pearson, who did this to you? Who pepper sprayed you in the face? Um, well, the University of California Davis has police um, officers on campus, UC Davis police. But we also have an agreement with the city of Davis that police officers can come in when needed. Um, and so the UC or the <clears throat> Davis police officers came in to help the UC Davis force um, when they were called for the protest. And so it was the UC Davis police that pepper sprayed you? Yes. Uh, are you yes. satisfied with the two police officers being put on paid administrative leave? Um, no, I mean, I'd, I'd like to know who really ordered that it was okay for pepper spray to be used on a peaceful protest. And you said you were also protesting in solidarity with Occupy Wall Street. Why is that important to you? Um, well, I'm a sustainable agriculture and food systems major, and 
I've studied a lot of the food industry and food corporations definitely aren't interested in feeding people. They're interested in making a profit and that's not really healthy for us, good for us in any way. And I'm also protesting the corporate greed that we see. And Nathan Brown, are professors and staff uh, supporting the students? They are. Uh, one of the most inspiring things about what happened in Berkeley two weeks ago on November, or, uh, on November 9th is that uh, faculty at UC Berkeley stood with their arms linked with students in solidarity. Uh, those faculty were assaulted by the police, uh, just as the students were. Um, at UC Davis, uh, there's been an outpouring of faculty support for the student movement since that happened on the Berkeley campus. Um, and I think that the, the statement uh, calling for the resignation of the chancellor and for a policy preventing the forcible removal of students by police uh, issued by the board of the Davis Faculty Association is a very strong statement of support uh, for the student movement. I want to thank you both for being with us, Nathan Brown, assistant professor of English at UC Davis, um, speaking to us from the University of California Berkeley Studios. And thank you to Ellie Pearson, sophomore at UC Davis, speaking to us from Davis, California. That does it for our broadcast. Democracy Now! seeking applicants for three paid fellowships beginning in early 2012. Go to our website at, at democracynow.org. We've extended our deadline. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.